2020 has been a tough year. The COVID pandemic, the free fall of the economy, the uprisings related to the death of George Floyd, and now devastating fires, all during an election year. Joining us today to make sense of it all is the Sacramento Bee's Marcos Breton. Marcos, given the year, what is still the most underreported story in Sacramento in 2020? Uh, I would say the most underreported story in 2020 is how um, the defund movement in Sacramento has really um, added up to nothing, uh, both in the city and the county. Um, the, um, the measures that the uh, city approved, in my view, are procedural uh, and simplistic and, um, uh, and uh, very likely could prove to be uh, ineffective. Uh, and in the county, um, uh, there's been no movement. Um, the, uh, the sheriffs are fully funded. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the county CEO put money meant for, federal money meant for COVID relief into the sheriff's budget to make sure it was whole. Uh, and you have uh, members of the county sheriffs who uh, don't think there's a problem at all and some who photograph themselves wearing Donald Trump masks. Um, so I would say that our elected officials uh, have done the best they can to mute uh, uh, the, the voices of uh, people asking for change. Uh, and it remains to be seen as to whether that change will ever come. It's interesting that you say that because the killing of George Floyd started a wave of activism and protest like Sacramento has never seen before. And many have thought that this was a catalyst uh, building on top of the previous death of Stefan Clark locally toward an explosion of activism and institutional change. And what you're saying is that institutional change has effectively been stopped in its tracks. Yes, I'm saying that uh, it has inspired a wave of activism and a new generation of, of, of future leaders in Sacramento. That's good. The current leaders in Sacramento uh, are dealing with the George Floyd uprising with 1997 measures. Um, uh, even in liberal city of Sacramento, uh, the mayor, all the council members are um, very deferential uh, to the police department and seem to have a very uh, lofty view uh, of them when the data shows differently, um, particularly in terms of uh, the attorney general uh, critiquing the uh, Sacramento police and that they are behind the curve on measures that other departments are undertaking. Uh, and so I would say that, um, and I think there are reasons for it that we can discuss later, but uh, that the elected officials in Sacramento currently uh, are very sensitive uh, to, the, to the police department and, and even the liberal Sacramento really want no part of defunding police. That's interesting uh, because when we had the Sacramento Police Department's uh, union or, or association head on our show recently, his statement was essentially, look, we want to do the right thing. We want to work with folks. But what you're saying is essentially that there is a behind the curtain, so to speak. It's not behind the curtain. It's out, out in the open. It's out in the open. Um, the votes that were taken uh, in the Sacramento City Council uh, were, were out in the open. Uh, uh, many of the measures that were, were being uh, uh, requested by uh, the emerging leaders in Sacramento were ignored or co-opted. Uh, I would say that um, uh, uh, police union leaders are part of the problem uh, and they are the last people who should be talking about um, wanting to do the right thing because traditionally they have never done the right thing. Uh, and in this case, their view of doing the right thing is trying to uh, run the clock out until people stop protesting, in my view. Uh, according, according to many of the activists that we've had on this program since uh, the uprisings, they say they're not going away. That being the case, and based on you describing what you believe is 
the police strategy of running out the clock, where does this end up? So it ends up uh, being, uh, as it always does, an issue that will um, uh, test the fortitude of advocates um, because, in my view, uh, the city council led by Mayor Dale Steinberg profess to want to do the right thing when it comes to police reform, but either have no idea how to do it or really have no appetite for it. Because what we're talking about would have been um, uh, seriously moving uh, funds out of the police budget and into communities. And uh, we're getting vague promises of, of, uh, of trying to invest in communities, but it, it really is going to test the fortitude of advocates to stay on that. Well, well wait a minute now. You say vague promises. Uh, according to the city and uh, the mayor and the people who advocate on his behalf, he's put this entire reform measure, uh, inclusive of strong mayor, on the ballot for later on this year that he claims and his supporters claim encompasses uh, virtually the majority of what it is that the activists have asked for. What the activists have asked for uh, in, the, in the strong mayor proposal um, those provisions that would, would include uh, citizen participation, um, those, to, to my reading of, of, the, of the measure, those, those, those measures are non-binding. And that's the whole ballgame right there. Uh, if you look back at the last time that we had a major crisis like this, uh, and uh, Sacramento set up a police commission, and it sounded great at the time, but I think if you speak to any of the police commission members, they will tell you that they have been, that their proposals have been ignored by the council, that they've had even a difficult time getting audiences with the mayor and council. And so uh, I think we're at a moment in time where citizens like ourselves need to hold uh, leaders, even popular ones like Daryl Steinberg, to account and really pay attention to the details. Now, uh, for the record, the activists uh, have stated that they feel that their reform measures have been co-opted by the mayor uh, and the council, and that the, the reform measures and strong mayor should stand separately from each other. And to do so, and to put them together was a way of essentially co-opting their platform. All that being said, though, the fact that we're having the discussion, that's not considered progress in itself? It is progress, Scott, it is progress, but we've had progress before, uh, after uh, Stephon Clark, for example. And I would argue that, um, uh, so what's been the most significant thing that came out of Stephon Clark? Um, well, a police video policy, I will say that, that we're, we're the, in the city of Sacramento, where even before it became state law, police video was released in a timely manner, including in the Stephon Clark case. So that, now that I think about it, that was even before Stephon Clark. But other measures um, like, the, like the police commission, like the Measure U commission, um, uh, that's been a bridge too far. And so I think what the advocates are arguing is that the, the, the mayor, who's a very skillful politician, the most skillful politician in our region, uh, has taken the substance of their suggestions, but, um, uh, uh, but have incorporated it into the power base of the office of the mayor, and uh, participation from citizen groups uh, would be non-binding. Uh, and so therefore, to my, to my reading, they would, they would continue the practices that we've seen with Measure U and, and the police commission now to where you do have citizens participating, it's just that their, 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 their suggestions are ignored. Well, I want to ask you a, a little bit about Strong Mayor itself, because this is not the first go at Strong Mayor. It uh, first came up under former Mayor Kevin Johnson. And the, my observation is, is that some of the same people who were in groups that were most against strong mayor before are now in support of it today. How do you read 
that that either epiphany or change of heart? Well, I mean, I think um, uh, the the strong mayor uh, that was done by Mayor Johnson was um, uh, they could never settle on a on a coherent message, uh, and they also I think the city has matured some since then, and I think the one of the big mistakes that Mayor Johnson made um, was doing it. Uh, in a non-presidential year, where where voter turnout is low, and and the only people who vote are people who vote no on everything, and so to put it in a presidential election is different. You get you're 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 going to have a a a, a bigger swath of people who are voting. Uh, as for those advocates who are are passionately against strong mayor, no matter what, uh, I would I would um, I would say I would ask. Well, would you say that the system is working great right now? Because I wouldn't say that it is. I, I, I would say that as a, as, a, as a longtime resident of Sacramento, that the office of the city manager, whoever is in that position, has so much authority that is not connected to my vote. Uh, and so, okay, you're going you're gonna to oppose uh, Mayor, Mayor Steinberg's plan, but what are you going to do about this system that really isn't working for advocates either? And I think that's the, that's kind of the, 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 the sad part about this. Well, I want to, I want to expand this out a little bit. You and I had a conversation earlier this year uh, about the county. And one of the things that, as you know, I've pressed some of the advocates that have been on this show about is how come there's no scrutiny of the county? And you and I had a discussion, and you actually acted on that and, uh, and wrote a column about the county. But I, I come to you. It, it appears that we put a lot of scrutiny on the city of Sacramento, but the surrounding areas, and in particular the county, does it get a free pass? It does get a free pass. Um, and that's by design. Um, first of all, as a 30-year resident of Sacramento now, I have come to believe by just by thinking about it all this time, that people in the city are far more invested uh, in the workings of their community than the county. I think there are huge swaths of the county uh, that that they moved out there for a reason. They wanted to they wanted to be away, and they don't have that. They so in particularly the further away you get from the city of Sacramento, in my view, what what most people care about is that their garbage is collected and that they they feel protected. Uh, and so I, there, are, there are politicians who don't get enough scru scrutiny who've been able to exploit that apathy that exists. But I also think it's a failure of, of local Democrats who um, spend their time trying to, uh, 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 throwing their money into races in the city of Sacramento, when in the county, uh, you have the agency charged with COVID response, and that's been completely bungled. Uh, at the county level, you have the largest law enforcement agency uh, where they gun down black men on the freeway and completely get away with it. Uh, a, a sheriff who's an avowed Trumper, uh, a, a sheriff um, association uh, a leader who takes a picture of himself on his Facebook page wearing a Donald Trump face mask and thinks it's funny. And so that, to me, needs to get a lot more attention. Incidentally, just on that account, we invited on our recent show where we had the head of the Sacramento Police Association who did come and make uh, his and the police's case. We invited the representative who is the head of the Sheriff's Association. Uh, unfortunately, um, he, he ended up not uh, joining us for that show. So we still don't have an account. Yeah, that's what that's what impunity looks like. When you feel that you don't really have to answer, uh, and until we're able to change that dynamic, um, the 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 things that we see in the county are going to continue. It's who has been it's almost like a rural county? Who has been, in your estimation, in 2020, the biggest disappointment uh, in terms of leadership within this region? Wow. I mean, I, th I think in the, well, um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's at several different levels. So obviously the governor is based in California. No, I, I want someone local, just one. Right. So locally, uh, I would say that um, uh, the majority of the um, supervisors, Sacramento County supervisors, uh, you expect um, the, the two Republicans, Susan Peters and Sue Frost, to vote no on anything that would protect um, 
renters and anything that would protect citizens, and they do. But the fact that two Democrats, Don Natoli and Patrick Kennedy, have gone along with them uh, uh, is completely uh, disappointing. And, and as a Democrat, uh, I look at the local Democratic Party uh, and, and the local unions, and, and I tell them all the time, you guys are focusing your guns on strong mayor and all this stuff, and you have Democrats voting like Republicans. Um, very consequential. Men. Like who? Uh, uh, well, you have Don Natoli and Patrick Kennedy, supervisors, both Democrats, who uh, have, have, between them, have voted against um, starting night meetings for Sacramento County so we could increase participation. They meet during the daytime, very disorganized meetings. A lot of times advocates can't get out of work to go. They voted it down. You have, you recently Don Natoli uh, voted down a measure that would have allowed voters to vote on whether the sheriff and the DA elections should be moved to presidential elections when more voters participate. He voted no. So, so you have Democrats voting against participation uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a body that is crying out for oversight. Uh, and at least right now, local Democrats and local union leaders are just kind of just like shrugging their shoulders about it. That's what I would say. So let's talk about COVID-19. How do you think COVID-19 has changed Sacramento permanently? Uh, I'm afraid that uh, COVID, for, so I speak for myself, COVID-19, has um, changed my perception of Sacramento. Um, I, I love Sacramento. I've lived in Sacramento for 30 years. I came from, I was a Bay Area transplant, like so many Bay Area transplants, thinking I'd be here a year or two. Here I am all these years later. I love Sacramento, okay? But um, COVID-19 has exacerbated inequality that we have tolerated for years, where the same neighborhoods get left behind, where when the, when the pandemic hit, um, all of a sudden, all this money that was gonna go from the tax increase of Measure U to communities was uh, set, uh, instead funneled into the police department because the elected officials were more concerned about maintaining that than keeping a promise. I know the mayor said, well, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Uh, the bottom line is, is that it's always a bridge too far. And you had the mayor, Angelique Ashby, the vice mayor, and other vehemently opposed Measure G, which would have, which would have locked in two and a half percent funding for kids in need in Sacramento, and they and and all the uh, a statistical breakdown of it shows that the most well-heeled neighborhoods in Sacramento voted against that. So so we like to think that we're cool. We're not. We're not as cool as we think we are. We tolerate inequality. We have tolerated uh, COVID ravaging our Latino population. Uh, uh, and, and when Councilman Eric Guerra has tried to sound the alarm, city manager Howard, Howard Chan and everyone just sort of like, you know. So, so I would say that, that uh, uh, we uh, at, at Sacramentans, um, COVID has, is, should be making us look in the mirror and question how, how great we feel about ourselves. Quickly, I'm looking for one name. Who has risen to the challenge of the times in 2020? Uh, I, think, I, I think there are a number of people. Uh, I would say Dr. Flo Jean Kofer, uh, who's on the Measure U Committee, is an epidemiologist. She's an emerging leader. I, I would say that she has responded. I, I would say that with her, there are, there are is a younger generation of people uh, who are, uh, you know, not, uh, going along with the with the company line. We'll see if, if Councilwoman Katie Valenzuela is that she talks the way that way, but we'll see if she is actually. I, I want to ask you about her election. What does it mean when all of the supposed smart people really put their their weight behind Steve Hansen and she completely surprised uh, the the sort of chattering classes with her victory? Well, I, I think it speaks to complacency <clears throat> on the part of um, uh, moderate Democrats in Sacramento who, um, who uh, did not pay attention to a new generation that is emerging. Uh, and unless, I predict, unless uh, the current elected officials take, uh, take that into account and try to partner with these young people, you're going to have more uh, people 
joining the city council uh, who are, are coming at it um, from a position of wanting to, to completely upend uh, politics. And maybe that wouldn't now, be a bad thing. Now, I want to give you an interesting perspective. I talk with the business community quite a lot. And when I talk to the activists, they believe that the, the, the political elected class is in the thrall of the business community. When I talk with the business community, they're as unhappy with the elected officials in this town and in this region as the activists are. And they say, no, the power is over there, somewhere else. If the activists think the business community has the power and the business community think the activists have the power, and where is, who is really pulling the strings? Well, I do think that the business community is more influential than, than they like to let on. But I also would argue that uh, in the main, Sacramento's business community is very um, timid in terms of taking stands, principled stands, for example, to support public education in Sacramento. If we're talking about really achieving equality, what's more fundamental than assuring that we're educating our kids. Sacramento City Unified School District, majority African-American Latino students, less than one week, a little less than two weeks from school and there's still not a distance learning plan in place. Everyone knows what the problem is. Business community is too chicken to really take a stand on it. So, so they, they get involved when it, when it, when it speaks to their interests, but when it, on principle stands, they do not. All right, fair, fair enough. Right, right now, the wildfires are raging everywhere. And it, it seems as beyond our control as the COVID-19 pandemic. We seem to be in this, this state of wildfire, you know, sort of calamity on a perpetual basis. Is there, is there something that we're failing to do? Well, um, where I think we're, well, to begin with, I think we're failing to acknowledge that climate change is here. Um, and that and that we're feeling the the impacts of it, um, uh, and I, I and the fact that we still have people who um, who don't really embrace that or or deny that uh, I think is a is a huge problem in terms of the um, uh, you know whether it's clearing or whether it's um, uh, uh, whatever in terms of whether we have we have we have built out into 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 segments of the state that we shouldn't have. I mean, those are those are those are those are long-standing questions. But uh, I think, uh, in the main, we um, we have not fully uh, appreciate how climate change is affecting California right now. I, I want to turn to sports for a second. Vladi Divac was released from his position as general manager of the Kings, but uh, you write in a recent column about. Um, the interference uh, and sort of perpetual presence beyond normal of majority owner uh, uh, Vivek Ranadive. Uh, who, who do DVOC's failures really rest at the feet at? DVOX or Ranadive? I think it's both because Ranadive put DVOC in a position to run the basketball operations when he had no experience in doing so. Uh, and so, okay, so then he, a few weeks ago, or however when it was, uh, Ron Dibay imposes on, 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 on uh, uh, Divac uh, a, a proposal where he's going to shift the power that Divac has to somebody else. And so Divac says, I don't want to do that. And so he's gone. But that's four months after Ron Adibe signed him to a four-year deal. So you're telling me that you changed your mind that drastically four months after you signed him to a four-month deal? That speaks to uh, dysfunctional leadership. Mr. Ranadive uh, is a very good man in many respects. And obviously, he's, he's, he's led an amazing life where he's been successful in every other endeavor. But his, his, the, the moves that he has made um, uh, while majority owner have, have, have continued the losing. That, so now we're, we're on 14 seasons of losing, seven under the previous owners and seven under Mr. Ranadive. So we used to... we. Once upon a time, I used to come on this show and say very negative things about the previous owners. Well, here we are uh, in the exact same spot. And so I, I take no pleasure in saying that. I'm a, I'm a rabid Kings fan, and it pains me that, that uh, while other teams are surging, the Kings are still stuck in place, but it speaks to uh, dysfunction in ownership. And, and so you can change the coach or the GM, but the dysfunction remains. Hmm. Well, here's hoping for a better season next please, year. Please, please. We will leave it there. 
And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.